Um, Tyler, can I ask you to please a word of prayer? Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come now so thankful for this time that we have, uh, that we can gather together and we can learn and hear more from your word. Uh, Father, we ask that you will help us, uh, that we will open our hearts and open our minds, uh, that we will be uh, receptive, that we will uh, just learn a lot, and that we can take these lessons, apply them to our lives, and that we will uh, just become better uh, men, better fathers, uh, better leaders of our houses, glorify you in all that we do. It's your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Taming your barbarians. We're going to be talking about disciplining the kids. And uh, I, he seemed to be pretty negative in this chapter, or he had a lot of really negative things, illustrations that he was using. So but before we jump into the lesson, last week we were talking about 37 seconds, that idea that a father only spent 37 seconds a day with his child and he didn't elaborate on it. And, and so I did some digging to find out and I texted Saul said, okay, I found the study <laughs> and it was in 1970s and they were, um, they were doing a survey of the time a new father spent with the newborn. So, Boston researcher, 1970. So spending time with the newborn during the first year. Well, the mindset at that time, the newborns were, you know, a lot of other people were holding them and, and that was just not really a man's job. <laughs> Zach's doing things that men didn't used to do. Hey, that's not my job. Of course, everybody wants to hold the new baby and it, it wasn't considered, that was just their mindset. You know, I, I don't burp the baby, I don't do diapers, things like that. And prior to 1980, dads did not do diapers. They just didn't change diapers. They didn't help out that much. 1982, they did a survey then and said that 43% of the men had never changed a diaper. So it's getting better. By the year 2000, it had dropped to 3%. Only 3% said they hadn't changed the diaper. So they're starting to get better. They're helping out. Good job, Zach. Thank you. <laughs> the famous joke that Ronald Reagan told about a baseball player that didn't want to change the diaper. And his wife had to lay it out in the baseball terms. Like, you stick the rear end on home plate, on, on, or you know, on, on the pitcher's mound. You put home plate over the top. You take first base and flip, flip it over there. Then you get third base, and then you put the pin in it. And it's good. Like, you can look it up. <laughs> okay. She's like, and the rains, it, it ain't over. You, uh, you got to start all over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was where the 37 seconds came from, is they determined that dad spent very little time with their child as they're, uh, the newborn as they're growing up. Um, we've been talking a lot about dads and their influence and the fact that there's a hundred year span that, that a hundred years goes pretty quick. Just in our lifetime, I mean, my wife's grandfather and my wife, they've easily covered 100 years in, just in three generations, but they have uh, 120 years, and sociologists, they refer to this as the generation rule. So you have five generations that overlap in that 120 year period. And not only do you have an influence on your child but all those subsequent generations. So for not just 100 years, 120 years, you're having an influence on what is going on. So in 1940, this B.B. Uh, Warfield, a historian, he was doing a study about this very thing. And so he's looking at two different families, two men. One is kind of an antagonist and one is a good Christian man, and he's comparing their lives. And so the first man's name is Max Jukes. He was an atheist, abolition of laws, no education, no responsibilities. He didn't want to have to be responsible for doing anything. He had 1,026 descendants in the five generations. 300 of them were in prison, 190 prostitutes, 500 alcoholics and drug addicts, he definitely didn't have a good influence on his thousand 
relatives. The next man, though, Jonathan Edwards. He was a Puritan minister. He took his children to church. He had 929 descendants. 430 of them were ministers. 86 university professors. 13 university presidents. 75 were prominent authors, five congressmen, two senators, and one vice president. All came from his tree because of the influence that he had. He was an influencer, not just on the generation of kids that he personally changed their diapers. <laughs> Probably not back then, 1840. Definitely so, not. Yeah. <laughs> But um, he influenced an entire generation, and that the tree just got big, and he had strong representatives coming from his family. We are an example like him. We're to be a loving husband, taking help and take care of the kids, an involved parent, um, being involved at the school. When my kids were little in grade school, I would volunteer and go up there and. I would make copies for the teachers or laminate things and cut it out. And, and I was always, I would show up and they said, oh, good, Kenny's here today. Because my work shift was to where I would work Wednesday, Thursday evening, Friday during the day, and then Saturday, Sunday at night, midnight shift. So I had most of Monday off after I took a short nap. And then I'd have Tuesday and Wednesday off. Well, and I don't go to work until 4 on Wednesday so I had most of the week and so I would go up to the school and do volunteer work at the the grade school and uh, the the teacher just loved it whenever I would show up they're going oh we can get all of our copying done <laughs> and so excited but then they changed principals and the principal didn't want parents involved with the school anymore and well okay so but just being an involved parent um, coaching their athletic teams helping them do various things, do projects, uh, scouting or whatever it is. Um, being an example as far as being a hard worker and letting the kids see you doing that work and, and being a good citizen, helping people out. And they pick up on that. They see the example that you leave behind, what you have done. Most of all, being a faithful Christian They see you coming to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, even Bible studies during the week, other times. Being a good example is the best sermon you can preach to your kids. All right, training in righteousness. Several Proverbs to look at. Proverbs 29 and 15. A rod and reproof impart wisdom, but a child who is unrestrained brings shame on his mother. They use the word rod several times through Proverbs, eight times, I believe. No, yeah, 14. I'm, I'll, it'll come up in a minute. <laughs> uh, but they use the word rod to refer to chastise, to discipline, correct. Proverbs 1.8, listen, my child, to the instruction from your father and do not forsake the teaching from your mother. Proverbs 13, 24, the one who spares his rod hates his child, but the one who loves his child is diligent in disciplining him. Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now jump into the New Testament. Every scripture, for, or 2 Timothy 3, 16, every scripture is inspired by God, useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Training in righteousness. Um, okay, I'm going to go back. We're going to time warp. Do you remember growing up and at 10 o'clock at night, they would make a tone and say, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? You don't remember that? Really? Anybody? You got to say which decade that was. <laughs> Okay, but they, they ran this for 20 years. They ran this until late 80s. And they would say this every night. And it was, you know, okay. That, 
that meant it was time to get in bed for us. <laughs> and the only people that were born in the early 80s were like the kids. Yeah, Saul remembered it. <laughs> I asked Saul about it, and he remembered Everybody it. Everybody else here wasn't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we made a joke about it in the Golden Girls. Well, and it, a lot of comedians and movies have picked up on that, and they use that as a joke. Yeah, because it ran for over 20 years. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? What prompted all that? Why did they make this PSA? Well, in the summer of 67, when this started, there was lots of unrest. There were riots and just lots of people protesting various things and lots of trouble in the streets. And so, okay, a lot of cities started cracking down and they said, uh, we're gonna impose a curfew. 10 o'clock is the curfew. And so it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? So <laughs> Oklahoma turf curfews today, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. for uh, teen drivers. And they, it varies from city to city. Midwest city, I think is 9 p.m. No, was there later? One, I think they were 11 p.m. actually. Um, but Bricktown is from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. And first offense of violating the curfew, they just give them a warning. But they've got their name, they put it in their little book or whatever. If they're a repeat offender, the fine, it was $100. But then I, I've read somewhere that that has gone up and it's $280 for violating that curfew. Yeah, pretty stiff. <laughs> I didn't even think about the fact that that all happened before you guys were, <laughs> were born. <laughs> so, <laughs> delinquency and minor offenses. He spent, the author spent five pages of presenting all this data, of telling stories about how bad kids are. And it was kind of like reading National Enquirer. Really? That happened? You just, you couldn't hardly believe it. But it wasn't just teens. It was elementary kids and even toddlers that are being, I don't know, very bad <coughs> delinquents. In Chicago, a 10-year-old dropped a five-year-old out a 14-story window because he was afraid the five-year-old was going to steal his candy. In California, a six-year-old beats an infant to death. In Colorado, a 10-year-old beat an infant to death. And there was lots of affluent neighborhoods that are having gang problems. Caucasian kids having their own gangs and, and getting into trouble um, they specifically did a study on uh, Phoenix, and I, I can't remember the name of the county, that the county is, it's so bad, the kids in the county are so bad that like 43% of them, close to half of them, already have a police record. Of the teens from these nice, wealthy families living in big houses and... They're, they've already been in trouble. It's not just here. In England, Switzerland, Hungary, Finland, it's happening everywhere. There was a news article recently where uh, a big football player, like a linebacker, he's quoted as saying, I guess I'm too strong after he, they beat a kid to death at a party. And that was a gang thing, and they were affluent kids. Wow. And that just happened recently. Or the Sydney scene happened recently. Wow. Um, and they just last week, um, a week ago yesterday, they had the school shooting in Finland. 12-year-old kid goes in and, and kills three and um, because he was being bullied. He shoots three people and it's just, it's sad. The, the world is going down the toilet. And one thing too, like, I didn't really get to it, let's talk about this time. Uh, like it basically is talking about like the, in Timothy like what time is it where people are to come and they're not going to actually like listen to sound doctrine any longer yeah so they'd be lo lovers of self lovers of money pride, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful and holy heartless 
And that's, even John said we're in the end of the days because the Antichrist has already gone into the world. You know, so I'm just kind of like that's where we, we have been for a very long time. Yeah. I just think of a, a scene from Tarzan movie, the animated Tarzan, and she's chased the monkey trying to get her sketchbook back, and she gets stuck up in the tree. The monkey jumps over to another tree, and she's spread out <laughs> with one leg on this tree, and one leg, she's doing the splits up in the air on the other tree, and she can't get to either tree, and she's high in the air. She said, well, it can't get any worse, and then suddenly, yeah, there's a clap of thunder, and it just starts pouring rain. <laughs> oh, perhaps I'm wrong. <laughs> but the, you look at the world, the state of the world, and, and where we are, where are we going? Is it going to get better, or is it going to get worse? Well, what does, it have, what does all this have to do with the dads? What do lawless kids have to do with dads? That's the big question. The biggest predictor of violent crimes is the number of households without a father. They take that survey data and they look at it. Okay, we're all, okay, we're, we have a cluster of no fathers in a large cluster in this area. And so they, they can pretty much predict that's where we're going to have trouble. Um, as far as projecting, I think that might be my next point. Yep the number of prison beds they're going to need in the future. They base that off of eighth grade reading scores. And they know, oh, we're going to need more beds. No dads. You have kids that are out of control. They're crazy. And I remember one day when I was volunteering at the school and the principal happened to not be there. And the secretary had called me in and, and said, Kenny, there was a fight on the bus. We want you to go out and get these kids off the bus. I said, only if I get to spank them. <laughs> they didn't let me. <laughs> these kids don't have a conscience. There's no remorse. They'll do something. And uh, don't want to name names. A family that's close to us. <laughs> Their kids, the dad would say, if you do that again, you're going to have to face the consequences. Well, what are the consequences? They didn't care. They'd do it anyway. I thought, you're going to have to have some better consequences. <laughs> George Barna is a famous uh, pollster that does a lot of Christian surveys, surveying Christian churches and what have you. He said, the, bu 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 <laughs> the barbarians must be tamed if civilization is to survive. So what's the father's responsibility in all this? If someone does not provide for his own, especially his own family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Provide for his own. What does that mean? What does it mean to you? I mean, self-sufficient, being able to um, provide for, I mean, I would just say, especially his own family, but it's, it's everybody that you take responsibility for, every thing, whether it's my pets or my family or children or yeah. parents at that, you know, at a certain age, you start caring for your parents, you know, Anybody that you have a responsibility to. Yeah, I went down several rabbit holes when I was studying about this, about providing for your own. Um, and you mentioned parents, grandparents, widows. Um, it was common in the first century that when a woman's husband died, she had to go live with somebody else. She couldn't go walk, work at Walmart or anything. So... She was at the mercy of the family to take care of her. And it kind of struck me when Jesus is on the cross and he's got half-brothers, but what does he do? He tells Mary, she assigns John to be the person to take care of Mary. Behold your son. 
behold your mother. That's just, I don't know, kind of curious to me because, like I say, he's, he had other brothers. <laughs> and they might have been standing by going, hey, what about me? <laughs> She's my mom too. <laughs> All right, this is, next one is a lengthy passage. Endure your suffering as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you do not experience discipline, something all sons have shared in, then you are illegitimate, illegitimate and not sons. Besides, we have experienced discipline from our earthly fathers, and we respected them. Shall we not submit ourselves all the more to the Father of spirits and receive life? For they disciplined us for a little while, as seemed good to them. But he does so for our benefit, that we may share his holiness. Now, all discipline seems painful at the time, not joyful. But later, it produces the fruit of peace and righteousness for those trained by it. And as far as disciplining kids, I mean, I'm not talking about an abusive father that just beats his kids all the time. But sometimes discipline is necessary to try and get the kids to walk the right path, to do the right thing. When they get older, yeah. We're going to get to that too. Romans 3.23, Paul is writing and, and he says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all going astray at times. We've all sinned. Well, in the book he was talking about the criminal toddlers. That it's not a heart problem. It's actually... An environment problem. It's the fact that they don't have anybody there to teach them right from wrong. They don't have people to teach them the fear of the Lord and show them the right way to go. They don't know that what they're doing is wrong because they haven't been taught. So they don't have a conscience about that. They can kill somebody or something and oh well that doesn't bother them at all they don't have an example to follow our civilization is a sinking ship <laughs> looking at all the headlines that he presented um, Romans chapter 3 this is leading up to the 323, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In verses 10 through 18, it's actually a quotation of several psalms that he has put together. Just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away together but they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness, not even one. Their throats are open graves. They deceive with their tongues. The poison of asp is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So even back in David's time, when he's writing these psalms, the world wasn't a, didn't seem like a great place to live. It seemed like they were already straying away from God. Sin separates us from God. So mankind gets separated from God and trapped in our depravity. And that's, what, that's the way these kids are. They don't even know God. They're separated from God. Nobody's told them about it, taught them right and wrong. Going back to Deuteronomy 6, 
That was what God's command was. That you're to teach these things to your children. Teach them to have a healthy fear of the Lord. Teach your sons and your grandsons, verses 1 and 2. And then verse 7, he says, teach them diligently till they get the message. You keep teaching them until they know. So what happened to Israel? You read through the Old Testament. Um, they come out of Egypt, and then Moses gets the Ten Commandments, and they start worshiping idols and serving foreign gods, and they lost the law. Some say that the law was lost for up to 600 years. Some say it was only about 50 years. And there were so many evil kings that didn't follow the law, and maybe they didn't know it either. So finally, <laughs> a priest finds a scroll in the temple, in the tabernacle, sorry, no, it was a temple by then. Yeah. Hey, look, here's a scroll. And they take it to Josiah, and Josiah reads it. And what does he do? He tears his clothes. He's in mourning because here's these things in the law that we haven't been doing. We're negligent. We've been neglecting what God commanded us to do. So we talked about dropping the ball, dropping the baton in the relay race. And the team, for years, were disqualified because they dropped the baton. Well, Israel dropped the baton. They didn't forward that message to their kids as they were told in Deuteronomy. He didn't last long with David either, like Rehoboam. I mean, he just took yeah. Solomon, you know, turned him aside and followed his wife's gods, and then Rehoboam lost the kingdom. Well, and they say you're only 20 years away from losing that completely, your influence in the family. So if you, know, if you don't get your kids taught, by the time they're an adult and they start having kids, if they haven't been taught, then the message is lost. It's gone. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I was ahead of myself all ago. So the fear of the Lord, oh, well, I was talking about the rod. Yeah, the fear, it, it's eight times that it is. So the fear of the Lord is 14 times in Proverbs. We'll take a look at those all in just a minute. Um, there was a teacher that was going to take early retirement, and they said, why? Why are you retiring so early? And she said, the problem is fear. The teachers are afraid of the principals. The principals are afraid of the superintendents. The superintendents are afraid of the school board. The school board's afraid of the parents. The parents are afraid of the children. And the children aren't afraid of nobody. He said over and over in, in this chapter that, that we're headed to anarchy and the children are the ones who are ruling the roost. And that's just kind of what's going on. True or false, Tyler? A lot of ways, it's very true. Yeah? The most challenging uh, students that I deal with are ones that don't, that come from broken homes. Yeah. Okay, to Proverbs. Let's look at some of these fear of the Lord. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they did not comply with my advice. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. But so it's the fear of the Lord that causes people to understand what's the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. So what makes this wrong? Well, God said, do not kill. So we know that it's wrong to kill. Foreign concept to some people. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked 
will be short. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children have a refuge. A truth that you can stand on. A shelter to hide in. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. <laughs> of course, they say with uh, additional wealth comes additional responsibilities and more of a burden to have to deal with that. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, no one turns away from evil. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm Um, just the, the word fear, we're going to get to this in just more in just a minute. I'll, I'll just wait. <laughs> <clears throat> the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. The safety net of the fear. The fear of the Lord, it's the glue that holds us all together. So as far as the word fear, not there yet. It's a safety net that keeps us falling into anarchy and chaos because if these kids had the fear of the Lord and they understood it's wrong to harm other people, it's wrong to kill people, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to bully, all of that. If they understood that, that all comes from somebody who respects others, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord mostly does not exist in society at all. And that's the reason the, the kids, they have no conscience. They don't understand right and wrong, good and evil. They just look out for number one. Paul said the law taught us what sin is. It was our guardian our schoolmaster. So then the law is our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under the guardian. In the King James Version, it says, for guardian, it says schoolmaster. And in the first century, they had somebody, a lot of times it was an older servant that would take the kids to school, make sure they got to school, would even tutor them and help them and make sure they were doing the right thing. So they, this guardian, the law, was like the guardian for us. All right, now we're going to get to fear. Of course, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. In Deuteronomy 6, we've already said that they're to teach this to their children. Teach them what the fear of the Lord is. Fear, the word fear. Not just being afraid, but it's respect, reverence, honor, and awe. There's more than just the element of being afraid in that expression, the fear of the Lord. Having respect and awe. He gave a, a, a kind of an interesting illustration. All the cars out here in the parking lot, they're sitting, they're still, they're idle. There's no danger in walking through the parking lot. But you go out here and you just go walking across North MacArthur, you better be careful because those cars are dangerous. <laughs> we, have a, we have a fear of that moving vehicle. We have fear of the cars. So we respect them and we avoid them. We try not to get in their way when they're driving fast down the road. And Christians, um, tying that to Christianity, 
Christians have this understanding of grace and mercy and forgiveness that non-Christians don't understand that. They don't get that. And so their fear is more of an afraid type fear that they're going to be afraid of the Lord because of what they're going to have to face. So how do children learn? Oh, it didn't come up. There we go. So how do children learn the fear of the Lord? How do we teach these kids without a conscience what they need to do to understand the difference between good and evil? Their first experience with fear is fear of the Father. Respect, honor, awe. Not being afraid of him. Oh, I did put that in there. I was ahead of myself again. <laughs> the barbarian priest. Um, now the sons of Eli, Hophni and, and Phineas, were worthless men and they did not know the Lord. Don't remember this? They didn't take the correct portions of the sacrifices. They took the best for themselves. Yeah, exactly. Hophni and Phineas, they're serving in the temple in place of Eli. They're serving for him. They're sleeping with the women that are serving in the tabernacle. They were taking the best cuts of meat for themselves. No, we don't want to boil this. We, we want to take this raw meat so we can cook it the way we want. And, and so they were not handling the sacrifices properly. These are the spiritual leaders. And they did not know God. This is somebody that people are supposed to look up to and respect and honor. But it's hard to when they're not doing the right thing. Eli failed in his fatherly duty. He waited until they're grown men and he got on to them about, you shouldn't be doing this. So then, along comes Hannah. She prays for a son. And she's going to dedicate her son to the Lord. So she has Samuel. And you know Hannah's friends are thinking, or maybe even asking her, what are you thinking? Eli did such a horrible job with his boys. Why would you give your son to Eli to let him raise your child? Spare the discipline, spoil the barbarian. <laughs> so the phrase, we've all heard it, Spare the rod, spoil the child. Is it in the Bible or not? Not in those words. True. <laughs> it is not in the Bible. Um, it's, it's kind of a paraphrase. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 23, 13, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> Eight times in Proverbs, the, the word rod is used for discipline. There's different methods of discipline, and you know your child, what works best in disciplining your child. I mean, if it's timeouts, great. If it's taking a toy away, great. If it's not letting him play on your phone or whatever it is, whatever gets your child's attention, that's the best way to discipline them. Proverbs 23, 4, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is David in the, the 23rd Psalm, of course, very famous. We could all probably quote it. The idea that the rod comforts them, the rod in this sense, though, is like a billy club that he had to protect the sheep. He'd also use it to guide the sheep, separate the sheep if they're, they're fighting. But the rod comforts me. And if you think of it in the sense of the discipline, well, why, is, why am I being disciplined for this? Oh, I could do better. <clears throat> Eli waited way too long to try and correct his boys. 
Okay, I've got, uh, and this is right out of the book, the 10 principles of discipline. Start early. <laughs> James Dobson said 15 to 18 months is an appropriate time to begin to correct your child. They start understanding then. Use discipline as a training, not angry venting. Don't take your anger out on the kids. Deal swiftly with disrespect. Discipline, rebellion, and defiance, not childish mistakes. Communicate the rule clearly and enforce it. Make sure the child understands why they're being disciplined. Admit when you are wrong and allow the drift away from the, the rule. Husbands and wives are to have a united front. Agree on this. And that, that goes true with, with so many other areas. I mean, the elders, when they have a meeting, they're going to make sure they all agree, come to an agreement of what we're going to do here, and everybody's on board with what we're our goal. Consider your child's personality, whether they're strong-willed or compliant. And uh, I think it was James Dobson that wrote uh, The Strong-Willed Child. Mm -hmm. Good book to read. Make sure the punishment fits the crime. And that was his 10 points to discipline. Any thoughts, comments? It's 10 o'clock, you know where your children are? <laughs> Yeah. It's been working. My youngest one is 18 months and she's uh, put up a good fight. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> that is the biggest thing out there is that you, you know your child, you know, your personality, and everything like that, because there's not like a one thing fits all. Like the love language that they wrote for the child's love language and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. necessarily good for every kid right whereas there's other people that could actually have better ideas and as the parent you're the one who loves them so you probably have the best idea well and, and if you're actually if you do love them. next week Saul's gonna get in he, I, I kind of like that chapter um, the idea that the child is bent training a child in the way that they're bent and a parent knows best how best to educate and discipline and you know what what is their strong suit and you're to encourage them into whatever they're good at. So that'll be a fun lesson next week. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this time that we've had to study part of your word. Father, be with us as we go into the world. Help us to be strong anchor men for our families, for our children. Help us to be loving husbands and, and hard workers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.